So good morning everyone. I hope you guys can hear me fine. I tend to speak in a larger audience usually. I have a st class that I'm running right now at Northeastern with 160 students. So um, this is actually a refreshing change for me uh, to come here to uh, Urbana-Champaign. And uh, I hope that in addition to you guys enjoying you know, your own sports, as Dr. Ahmed said, you probably have watched the Olympics as well. We had some really wonderful uh, events last night. Uh, Michael Phelps again won a gold, and this morning probably you guys have heard uh, another uh, very young, talented uh, gymnast uh, won a gold. So for the United States team, uh, this is a real major accomplishment. I wanted to uh, talk to you briefly this morning and, and hopefully get some thoughts from you as well um, about some of the issues in nanomedicine, especially in relation to cancer. So I'm going to focus uh, uh, my talk specifically on cancer. And, and I come from a uh, uh, sort of a thought process that you have to really know the problem before you can solve it. Um, and so what you're going to hear is the medical side of cancer and the, some of the challenges in cancer. And then how can nanotechnology help at least in trying to alleviate this problem? Uh, how can we try to uh, improve drug delivery? How can we make better diagnostics, uh, improve uh, uh, imaging, and so forth? So this is a review article, and I strongly recommend um, that you please take a look at it. This is a second phase of uh, an article written by Hanahan and Weinberg. Uh, Doug Hanahan used to be at UCSF. He's now in Zurich. And Bob Weinberg is a Nobel laureate at MIT. And what they did in this um, review article, first was published in 2000 and, um, 2000, and then subsequently another version came out in 2011 is that basically took a look at cancer and found what are the differences in cancer from normal cell. And they have hypothesized several different areas that cancer um, tends to have changes occurring in cancer cells as compared to normal cell. And some of these we're going to touch upon. So for those of you who are not familiar with the uh, biology of cancer, this will be a refreshing, um, just a, a refresher on, on understanding issues such as cellular energetics. This means that cancer cells metabolize glucose differently compared to a normal cell. Normal cell breaks it down to carbon dioxide and water. Cancer cells break it down into lactic acid. Um, and so this affects how cancer progresses. It affects how resistance occur and some of the things that we're going to talk about. There's an inability to resist death. Mutations that constantly are, you know, there is a tremendous kinetic uh, uh, effort here to try to understand how these mutations occur and how we can alter these. The most important aspect of cancer is really these two, uh, the formation of blood vessels. Uh, basically, it's a recruitment of blood vessels from nearby areas in order to enhance the tumor proliferation, in order to make sure that tumors have sufficient oxygen and nutrients. And this also, these blood vessels then occur, become the conduit through which cells from the primary cancer mass go to other areas of the body. So it's a place where metastasis can occur. And metastasis is really the most critical aspect of cancer. About 80% of deaths that occur from cancer occur because of metastasis. So we're going to touch upon some of these areas in terms of drug therapy, in terms of imaging, in terms of development of nanotechnology. So how does nanotechnology work? Well, you have probably seen this slide from other speakers that you've had uh, here as well. Basically, the idea of nanotechnology is that we have the ability today, and here especially at, at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, as well as other places across the country, this ability to make matter at such a small lens scale. We are talking about a lens scale of between 1 to 100 nanometer. and. Um, the idea is to create these types of structures, fairly complex structures, uh, in some cases you know, uh, growing these structures or, or uh, creating them from, uh, from bottom up or in some cases from top down. But the idea is that you're able to generate these structures with sophisticated uh, functions and characterize this, these very, very tiny structures using electron microscopy and other types of techniques and impart function and makes useful functions out of it. And how that function is related to biology is the fact that many of the biological structures tend to then be at the same lens scale. And one can start to understand a little bit about how these types of natural uh, man-made structures 
can innervate with natural structures to impart some sort of a functionality, a beneficial functionality in the body. And that's been the driving force for converting nanotechnology or having the uh, usefulness of nanotechnology both in biology as well as in medicine. And I'm going to focus mostly on the medical application. So one of those properties that makes nanomaterials different is illustrated with this particular example. If you look at gold in the bulk, and we're all familiar with gold in the bulk. We have this in jewelries and, and various types of um, articles that we, you know, including the medals that the Olympians won. But actually, I heard that it's really not 100% gold. It's actually just gold coating on, on a silver medal. Uh, so those guys are getting cheated. But anyway, um, the, uh, what you see at the nanoscale, and I'm sure you guys have seen this as well, is that gold is very different. It's this red colored liquid. Uh, suspended in water. These are gold particles of 20 nanometer in diameter with a surface that's adsorbed with ascorbate. So the ascorbate ion is basically creating a negative charge and keeps these particles repelling with, from each other. And because of this repulsion, electrostatic repulsion, these particles are not settling, they're not aggregating. But if you add a drop of sodium chloride, 10% to this, it will aggregate right away because you break the charge. What we have done is we have made these gold uh, um, particles, these spheres, and we mix silver. So if you combine silver chloride and gold chloride and then precipitate or, or, or reduce these two ions and create metallic alloy particles by simply changing the gold to silver ratio, you're able to create particles of the same size with the same shape, except they have different optical properties. So you can see that by just simply taking advantage of two metals, you can take, uh, you can impart other functionalities. You can add, um, uh, you can create uh, another type of material, another type of um, uh, of application depending on the optical properties. And this is 100% silver particles. So mixing it at different mole percent, we're able to generate particles of different optical density. But this is not just with gold spheres. You can think about rods, and I know many in, in, uh, here at, at this institution as well as Purdue and other places work with gold nanorods. So nanorods are interesting because now you can change the, not only, I mean, they are first for the shape is different, but by changing the aspect ratio, the ratio of the length to the width, you're able to, again, generate particles with different optical properties. They can be you know, fairly purple to reddish color to pink to purple to other types of you know, colors. And these colors are representative of the absorbance pattern, how which uh, wavelength of light the, these particles will absorb. And the, for biological uh, significance, the NIR is the one of the most attractive wavelength for absorbance. So using these particles for NIR absorption for both imaging as well as therapeutic application becomes very relevant. But it's not just gold. You can start to see these types of structures becoming relevant for other types of materials as well, including fibers made from polymers. So tissue engineers are now making these very, very thin fibers from the biodegradable polymers. And these fibers, once they're made to form a tissue engineering construct, has a very different cellular properties than fibers made from the same polymer but casted in bulk. And the reason is that these thin fibers are able to interact with cellular substructures. So when a cell is adhering onto a, a scaffold, there is actually receptor interactions with the fiber itself. And that receptor interaction leads to cellular proliferation, leads to biological activity. In some cases, we have even seen examples where blood vessels can grow. And you can see carbon structures also, very, very interesting uh, materials, uh, both fullerenes as well as carbon nanotubes, single wall or multi-wall carbon nanotubes, a lot of interesting things happening in this area from the biomedical side, especially from the device side. Um, I, I was just talking to one of your colleagues here was uh, interested in stents. And here is an example of our work where we used stents, uh, in this case, this metallic stent, but instead of just a bare metal, there was an interest in creating a nanoporous coating on top of a stent. And the idea is that instead of just having a, uh, a drug-filled stent marketed by a company, 
Wouldn't it be interesting if the physician at the bedside has the ability to actually fill the stent with the drug? So the coating on top allows you to basically dip this particular stent in a drug solution, imbibe the drug into the substructures of these nanoporous material, and have the stent ready for delivery of drugs right at the bedside. And many companies who are interested in developing this. This was project was funded at Northeastern by Boston Scientific. And then many, I'm sure you have heard about quantum dots. These are cadmium and selenium and other metal-based nanostructures. And the fact that they have this very, very bright fluorescence is because of quantum confinement. And the quantum confinement and the optical properties that result from this lead to these particles being excited at one wavelength, but then emitting uh, the, at very different wavelengths depending on their size. So all of these properties of nanomaterials is unique to this length scale. This cannot be done in, with bulk materials. And so there is that advantage of how nanostructures can help. And so the question now is where is the marriage between medicine and nanomaterial? And how can we make this marriage work? And so with some of the examples I'll share with you is some of our work. And I'm going to go through one with diagnostic imaging application. And then there will be another, some others where we have spent a lot of time thinking about is how to get drugs to the right place in cancer and how to make a drug more effective in cancer. So we'll go through several examples of these um, with you in a few minutes. So first example is early colon cancer detection. So the way colon cancer is detected right now all over the world is by what's called an endoscopy guided biopsy. Uh, some of your parents probably have gone through this procedure. It's basically having a, a, a colonoscopy uh, work done which is under anesthesia. And the idea is that the, uh, a tube is inserted through the rectum, it goes into the uh, colon, and you're able to, uh, uh, so whoever is doing the diagnosis is going to look for various types of polyps in the colon, various types of growth, abnormal structures. And if they find something suspicious, they will basically use the tip of that endoscopic uh, tube to resect that particular tissue. The tissue is then harvested and it goes to a pathologist to try to determine whether it, it, it is um, uh, cancerous or not and whether it's benign or malignant. There are many, many individuals who have benign polyps in their colon and so this is nothing to you know, be worried about. But when it becomes malignant, then we worry about whether, you know, how, how far that colon cancer is. Is it local? Is it disseminated? And then subsequent uh, therapeutic strategies decided, whether it's surgery or chemo therapy or both. What we are doing is, and, and others are doing, is trying to integrate within that same approach. So we're not changing endoscopy. We're not going to replace endoscopy. Endoscopy is a mainstay. But could we add something more valuable to endoscopy? And what we are doing, we work with a colleague in, in uh, Boston area, in Andover, Massachusetts, who is an expert in the use of optical coherence tomography. This is a reflective technique that allows you to create a better diagnostic through depth profiling. So you cannot just look at superficial tissue, but you actually get an, a measure of how, you know, the depth and whether there's any pathology as you go deeper into these mucosal surfaces. And what we have done is put, in addition to just endoscopy, our interest is to create contrast-enabled endoscopy. Just as you go for magnetic resonance imaging, you have a contrast injected in you, and that contrast helps to get better um, uh, images in MRI or ultrasound. There are these microbubbles that act as contrast. We are interested in developing contrast-enhanced colonoscopy uh, so that these, uh, the contrast itself will bind to the cancerous tissue once the surgeon is able to see, or once the uh, physician is able to see a, a polyp, they could actually turn on that uh, reflective mode and see how much of the tissue is invaded deep into the colon itself, and from there make on-site diagnostic, at least early on, and then take that sample, again, through biopsy and see if it's pathological or not. So our approach is uh, a combination of fluorescence and OCT imaging using this contrast enhanced uh, colonoscopy and our particles that we are making, these nanoparticles uh, encoded on a microsphere uh, has both a NEIR fluorophore to help us guide the endoscopic probe to the right place and then OCD imaging to allow for depth profiling once you have found the needle. So it, it, you know, the challenge here is still a needle in a haystack and so the first thing with fluorescence, we're going to find the needle, and with OCT, we'll see how deep that needle is buried into the tissue. So our approach 
is uh, fairly straightforward. This technology is developed in collaboration with uh, uh, the uh, group of uh, uh, Nick Iftimia, who, who did the uh, 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 and I have that next image uh, in the next slide. Uh, our contrast is basically a polymeric, a biodegradable polymeric microsphere. This is made from polycaprolactone. We then surface modify this to in, uh, absorb gold particles. These are gold nanoparticles of around 20 nanometer. And so it creates a, 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 not a core shell structure, but simply gold particles that are absorbed. And by having these particles absorbed onto a smooth surface, what happens is that you create many scattering points. So this system allows you to, when you shine a laser beam, to create many different scattering uh, centers from this, and so that amplifies the OCT signal. Inside these particles, we put the IR fluorophore, and so that helps us in the fluorescence uh, imaging. And the surface of these particles are then decorated to interact with the receptors on the tumor cell itself. So we have used two different types of uh, binding peptide. One is RGD, uh, this is arginine glycine aspartic acid that binds to the uh, uh, integrin receptors, both on the blood vessels as well as on cancer cells. Uh, and then we have also used an antibody against EGFR, epidermal growth factor receptor, to bind to the surfaces of uh, precancerous lesion in the oral cavity. The system, the hardware itself, is fairly complicated. I'll just simply walk you through. This is the actual setup, and Nick is the expert. He's at a company called Physical Sciences Incorporated, and we have two STTR grants that we, uh, through NCI, um, on, on one on uh, colon cancer, another one on pancreatic cancer. And basically, he is the one who creates this OCT probe uh, that combines fluorescence and OCT, and so these are fiber optic probes that are developed specifically for small animal imaging and they're able to combine, and you can get both fluorescent signal as well as the OCT signal. And just to show you what it looks like, when you take these uh, particles and you feed them to cells, these are colon cancer, human colon cancer cells, HT29, they, they overexpress uh, this integrin where RGD binds. So we, in this particular case, we have used the RGD modified particles. And you can see that in the presence of these particles, the particles are on the surface of the cell. They're too large to get inside the cell. Uh, so we are able to image the fluorescent signal here. And then when you take these same particles and inject and, and administer orally to animals that have orthotopic uh, colon cancer uh, developed in the colon itself, and we give this as a suspension, see the normal tissue, there is some nonspecific binding of the particle. But imagine, you know, this is where the tumor is. And you see how much, you know, there's a very high density of binding of these particles. I mean, you can even just from a visual observation, you can see this. This is the fluorescent signal that comes from the tissue. So we took out the animals, excised their colon, and then looked for fluorescent signal. And then Nick was able to do OCT imaging. And what he's able to show that with the combination of fluorescence, now that we're able to find the needle, we can look at how deep that tissue damage is. And so he's able to use OCT to characterize the depth of, of, of damage. And he, he is a, an expert in this and to, tells me that this contrast-enhanced OCT works better than without having the contrast or, you know, in the case of normal uh, tissue. So this work is progressing. We are very much interested in not only colon cancer, but now uh, we're also collaborating with a group at Foresight Institute in Boston to try to develop an oral precancer detection that a dentist uh, when you go for your routine dental exam, we should be able to find a way, similar type of technology, to detect if someone has oral precancer in their oral cavity. And this is a problem, especially in places around the world, in India and other places where people chew tobacco and other types of um, uh, pro uh, carcinogens that tend to create uh, oral precancer. So the next three or so examples now, we're going to focus on where we have spent most of our time. Um, you know, we are very much a pharmaceutical science group and we are interested in how to make drug, drug therapy better. And the challenge in drug therapy right now is to explain a little bit in this slide. The first problem we have in drugs is that we are making more and more molecules that are not going to go to their desti destination by themselves. There are two reasons for that. One is that more and more of our molecules are very hydrophobic. They're oil soluble, and if you are going to use blood as your carrier, blood is 90% water, 
you're not going to get these hydrophobic molecules to go to the right place because they're just not going to dissolve in blood. And if you think about, and the, and the reason this is a paradox right now in pharmaceutical drug discovery, uh, the, that you know, when you want drug to be more potent, you have to have them very hydrophobic. But at the same time, you still need them to be ferried to the right place. And so, you, you know, if you make them very potent, they will have very high activity in cells, but they will not be delivered to the right place when you administer it to animals or to, to human patients. So that's one challenge. How do you get these hydrophobic molecules to the right place in the body? The second challenge is more and more we are developing drugs that are you know, water soluble in this case, but these are biomolecules. They are, have charge. They are labile. They are not stable. Even you know, breathing on these for a few seconds and they are destroyed. Molecules like sRNA microRNA, genes, peptides, proteins, and so forth. So how do you take you know, these molecules and make them into drugs that could be useful at the clinic, at the bedside? And again, the same problem. How do you, you know, get them to the cell? In this case, the problem is getting through the cell membrane, getting into the cell, getting out of the endosome, getting into the uh, cytoplasm, and then doing their function. So in both cases, we need to have some sort of a smart luggage that can carry this. Uh, that can take this to the right place. So it's almost like an envelope that will carry your letter to have a zip code so that it delivers to the right address. The other is, as I said, more and more of our need for in drug delivery is basically inside the cell. This is where our targets are for therapy. If you hear people talk about drug targets, drug targets are becoming more and more remote from where the drug is administered. We administer in the, in the systemic circulation. We give it orally or inject it into a patient or give it through the skin. But the target is inside a cell in the mitochondria or the nucleus or the endoplasmic reticulum. So how do you make sure that drug that is delivered in the bloodstream actually crosses all of these different barriers and comes to the inside of a cell and is able to be there for sufficient amount and sufficient concentration in sufficient time to induce the therapeutic effect. And then last thing is as, as healthcare costs are increasing, people are asking, do we really need to have these drugs delivered invasively? Many of these drugs that we have are injected, like antibodies. Or, you know, even small molecule drugs require a clinician to administer it. Could those drugs be, could you improve the delivery or change the delivery and make it much more favorable for patient to self-administer? And so the other aspect of drug delivery comes from this question of how can we change the route of administration and make it more patient compliant and make it more effective for self-administration. So those are the three examples I'll talk about uh, from cancer perspective and how we have taken nanotechnology to try to solve these three problems in drug delivery. Our first example is a huge problem in cancer. It's called multidrug resistance. If you go to a clinic right now, and, or if you have a relative or, and God forbid, uh, someone suffering from cancer, they will undergo some sort of a testing. They confirm that they have cancer. They will put on to a therapeutic protocol. Uh, in our case, we tend to focus a lot on ovarian and breast cancer. So in ovarian cancer, 70% of women who are identified to have ovarian cancer are identified at, at what's called stage 2, which means that their cancer is already metastasized from the ovary into the peritoneal cavity. At that point, 70% of the women are, have actually resistance to the first line of therapy that is uh, indicated for ovarian cancer. And these drugs are called taxanes, or, and, and paclitaxel, which you will see as one of the drugs we work with extensively, is a, is a model of those. 70% of women are already resistant to therapy. They, they will not, this drug will not work. So they you know, will have a combination, they'll have a cocktail. And typically they always start with a cocktail of drugs, three or four drugs together. And at some point in their, uh, when women, these women go through, they are going to again relapse. And it's inevitable that when they relapse, the drugs that they were treated in the first round are not going to be effective again. So either you have to increase the doses or you have to change the therapy. Both of these cause side effects and ultimately patient dies, not because of the cancer itself, but because of all the toxicity of the drug that they have. So the question we asked, this is a, a, a sort of a 10-year study right now in my lab, what is going on in drug resistance 
and how can we improve cancer therapy much, and create much more smarter therapies rather than just keep on adding more and more drug to the protocol or add more and more doses, increasing the doses, and ultimately, you know, just uh, cause toxicity. I see a question. Um, yeah, so for the ovarian cancer, is it pretty much like commonplace to have a hysterectomy afterwards? It, it, to many cases, but ma majority of patients actually want, you know, the, the hysterectomy is for uterine cancer or uterine fibroids. Uh, but ovarian cancer, you know, they might not even have hysterectomy. The, the problem with ovarian cancer and the reason why it's diagnosed late is because the symptoms, the, the typical cramping and so forth, ha, uh, could be a multiple origin. So, you, they, you know, the idea that these are actually due to a potential uh, uh, ovarian cancer only occurs after the stage two because now, you know, it starts to disseminate and you start to, uh, the, the women who are afflicted with the disease will start to show multiple symptoms, not just one. Um, and, and therefore the disease is diagnosed late. Oh, and then you, you said that ovarian cancer relapse is very high, correct? Yeah. I just meant after the first chemo treatment, isn't it standard? To it is standard to remove the uterus, yeah, yeah absolutely. They, Do that's they a certain. remove the ovaries? They, they will, it depends on how much, uh, you know, the, the tumor has disseminated from. So in some cases it makes sense to remove the ovary, so they'll do an ovarectomy. Um, but other times when it's at stage three, for instance, it, you know, that's just too late that it, even removing the ovaries is not going to change that much, uh, the prognosis of the, uh, of the disease. So they will decide based on whether, you know, to start chemo right away, high dose chemo sometimes, and then give a week off. Um, but ovarectomy is, is common stage two. Hysterectomy is common because, again, you want to make sure that, you know, the, the, and then whatever, uh, again, the, the other surgery is to look for nodules in the peritoneum and see how many of those nodules can be removed. The problem is that some of them are so small, you can't really see them, and so surgeons are not able to remove them. Well, like the women I know that have had um, different cancers, um, had the hysterectomy after chemo. Yes. So in order to prevent a relapse with these women with ovarian cancer after their first treatment, it all removed and, would, and then lower their chance of relapse. Still, the relapse rates are, you know, I mean, it, it, there is some decrease in the incidence, but it's not really in, uh, guaranteed that hysterectomy will prevent relapse. Uh, the relapse, as we will talk about in a few minutes, is really because of the problem. Um, right now, the more and more theories are coming out that there are these residual cells. Uh, that are remaining, even with surgery, even with chemo, we're not able to remove all of the cells. And so hysterectomy by itself may remove some of the hormonal, uh, may affect the, you know, the hormonal levels in the, in the body, but they're not going to remove the tumor cells that are remaining if there are any residuals. So the, um, the residual cancer cells would have been moved outside the ovaries at that point? Yeah, that oh. time it's metastasized. So that's really the problem, that you, know, you, you are not going after all the different cells, and so you are able to now, you, what you're left behind, you, you may have taken out the primary, you may have taken out some of the culprits, but there's still these smaller you know, nodules that are left behind. So coming back to this problem of, of, of drug resistance, you know, and, and it is very common, not only in ovarian cancer, in breast cancer, in lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, and these are the most lethal cancers that we have. And so the question of, you know, how can we change the, uh, the uh, mortality rates in cancer, one of the ways we have been thinking about is that if you can come up with a strategy that helps to prevent drug resistance, to improve therapy such that there is no drug resistance problem, you will be able to, you know, improve the mortality rates or, or decrease the mortality rates. So the, our approach is based on a hypothesis that as cancer grows, and I mentioned in the first slide that there is this process called angiogenesis, the formation of blood vessels. And interestingly, if you look at blood vessel formation in normal tissue, you have a controlled blood growth. There is blood vessel formation and then blood vessels that are destroyed once, you know, the, so the process is in balance. And at some point, you get this nice, you know, uh, the, the red here represents the artery, the arterioles and the capillaries, and the blue here represents the vein. And so you get this nice structure in the tissue. In cancer, what happens is this abnormal blood, supply, blood vessel formation. So the tumor mass, imagine something that's growing inside your body, and it's basically there is, you know, at some point it reaches a certain diameter or a certain uh, size where the blood supply is just not enough. So the cells in the interior part of the tumor, 
in this part of the tumor, which are away from the blood vessels, start to sense that they're not getting oxygen, they're not getting nutrient. And then they start sending out signals telling the blood vessel around it, these are usually growth factors, and one of the most common growth factors is called VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. So these growth factors are sent out to the nearby blood vessel and say, gee, we need blood supply, we need blood supply, please bring some blood to us so that we can get food and we can get oxygen and we can continue to survive. However, the tumor's blood supply is somewhere here, I mean, the, the blood vessel is here, so it starts branching and sending out the blood supply, but that blood supply is restricted to the periphery. Now these cells still do not get oxygen nutrients, so they keep on sending out more and more of these signals, and they keep on getting more and more blood vessels. So there is this aberrant blood supply or blood for vessel formation that occurs in tumors, very different from normal tissue, and it is much more leakier. It's much more, you can see that the structure doesn't really lend itself to these nice capillaries and, and our, uh, arterioles and venules like the normal tissue. And if you t excise a tumor, you see this type of uh, almost like a, you know, a very haphazard pattern. But the other part of this is that the lack of blood vessel going into the um, middle part or into the parts of the tumor creates a region called hypoxia or lack of oxygen. And so the oxygen pressure decreases as you go towards the depth from the blood, where the blood vessel is to the more you know, uh, distal part of the tumor and you see this exponential decrease in oxygen pressure. So these cells are completely devoid of oxygen. And because they're devoid of oxygen, they actually change their metabolism profile. So they take glucose differently. If you have a normal tissue, it will convert glucose, as I said, into carbon dioxide and oxygen, and this is what happens in all of our tissues. But in tumors and these proliferative tissues, glucose is converted to lactate. So the pH is dropped as well. And so our hypothesis is that because of hypoxia, because of the lack of oxygen, and we're not able to provide enough blood supply to these tumors, the cells that are growing in this region, and previously they were thought to be dead cells, but now we know that these cells are alive and they basically go through a phase where they you know, go through senescence, they remain inactive, these cells adapting, just as you have wild animals become aggressive when they're deprived of food, these cells are adapting to the harsh environment, the low pH and the lack of oxygen by becoming more aggressive. So they are evolving and these cells are now the multi-drug resistant cells. And so we tested this hypothesis by basically asking the question, what if you actually take two populations of cells, cancer cells, and we worked with, again, breast and ovarian cancer, these are human cancer cells, and we exposed these cells to two different environmental conditions. Normoxia, which is basically 21% oxygen ambient air, and hypoxia, which is 0.5% oxygen, and we then tested to see what would happen to the resistant markers. We know some of the markers that are present in resistant cells, like HIF-1, EGFR, glucose transporter levels tend to be increased. There's a pump that these cells have called PGP that takes the drug from inside the cell and pushes it outside. And then the glucose metabolizing enzyme hexokinase 2 is also changed once you have this resistant cell compared to the same wild type cell. And then, uh, Lara Millane, who was a PhD student in my lab, and one of the Iger students, just like Jen here, um, also took these same cells that were growing under two different conditions and put them in mice. So these are human cells, so we use nude mice, mice that do not have their own immune system, and grow human tumors. In this case, these are breast cancer cells, so we put them in the mammary fat pad of these female mice, and so that we can develop a tumor right in the, uh, where the uh, human tumors occur. And then test it to see if you take these tumors after they've grown to different sizes, and take these sections, and stain for these markers, what would happen? Do they overexpress this marker when they're exposed to normoxia versus hypoxia, or, or vice versa? And what, you saw, what we saw was very interesting results. This is a very, very uh, busy slide, but I want to just focus your attention to one particular lane, and that's lane seven. Lane seven here represents a breast cancer cell. This is MDMB231. It's called estrogen negative, progesterone negative, and HER2 negative. So this is called triple negative breast cancer. 
This is the most aggressive form of breast cancer. Women die of this cancer more than any other types of cancer today. And so we took these breast cancer cells and exposed them to five days of 0.5% oxygen. Five days. We thought, oh, five days, these cells will be dead. But interestingly, 99% of them survived five days of 0.5% oxygen. That's because they've evolved into this different phenotype, this aggressive phenotype. And what you see on lane 7 is that all the markers that are representative of resistance cells, if you compare the lane 7 cells to lane 2, lane 2 is a model of a resistant cell, in this case scope 3 ovarian cancer that we know that to be resistant, you'll see that all these markers of resistance are similar when you expose a regular cancer cells to five days of hypoxia as a resistant cell. Every single thing, uh, the P glycoprotein is overexpressed, MRP is overexpressed, EGFR, GLUT1, the transporter for glucose, hexokinase 2, and the other markers of resistance. Now this is in cells, so you say, well, whatever happens in cells is really not reflective of what happens in the cancer itself. It's just a population of cells growing on a petri dish. But if you take these cells and grow these tumors in these animals, and then at different size, so here is a tumor volume of 100 millimeter cubed. We took the tumor mass out, and this is our sort of the small version of cancer in, in a 21 gram mouse. And you see that when new tumors are grown under hypoxic conditions, the green here, the green stain, reflects the positive for the antibody against the particular marker. So when you see green stains, that means there is a greater concentration of this marker for the tumor that's growing under hypoxic compared to normoxic. If the same cells, these breast cancer cells, were grown under 21% oxygen and we developed the tumor, they're not as resistant to therapy as the ones that were developed with 0.5%, five days of hypoxia. So hypoxia induces resistant phenotype, and it is important because it creates this, you know, the, all the markers of resistance. And the other part of this uh, issue is that this particular enzyme, hexokinase 2, is metabolizing glucose. And glucose metabolism, as I said, in these tumors produces lactate. So our stra therapeutic strategy then was focused on how to inhibit this enzyme. If you take a 250 millimeter cube, you can still see there is a greater concentration or the greater expression of these resistant markers under hypoxia, but then you start to see some of the normoxic tumors also developing this uh, same type of marker. And then if you take a 500 millimeter, this is the larger version. So we had smallest tumors, middle and large you start to see some normalization of these, that once the tumor grows too big, then the, the differences between the you know, resistant uh, that's growing in vivo is no longer the same from the cells that we've implanted. So we don't see the effe that effect once the tumors grow too large. That's why when patients are, are diagnosed late, in this, when the disease is diagnosed late, they come up with this type of prognosis to begin with. Whereas early diagnosis, we'll be able to catch these tumors before they become resistant. So the idea of how to improve diagnostic to make the diagnosis early so you're not, you don't have this challenge. And then the second way is to ask the question, if you get to that type of patient who's got a resistant marker, tumor, it's not just to get the drug to the right place, but how can we change the uh, therapy as well? So this is a, a, our sort of st therapeutic strategy for drug resistance. We make a polymeric nanoparticle, in this case biodegradable polymeric nanoparticle. The surface of this polymeric nanoparticle is decorated with a targeting ligand. In this case, it's a small peptide, 11 amino acid, that targets the EGFR receptor. Remember, this is the receptor that's overexpressed in this drug resistant model. Inside, we have encapsulated two drugs in one particle. We put a drug called paclitaxel, which I mentioned it's effective in both breast cancer and ovarian cancer. And then this drug is though interesting. This is our resistant modulator. This drug is inhibiting glucose metabolism. It inhibits this enzyme hexokinase 2. So now you're, you're not metabolizing, these tumor cells are not metabolizing glucose, which means they're not producing lactate. And we wanted to see what effect by putting this drug together with a cell killing drug would have on improving the outcome in drug resistance. And so we first, uh, just to show you, these are the particles, about 150 nanometer in diameter. Our chemistry for conjugating the peptide, 
We basically make the 11 amino acid peptide with four glycine spacer and a cysteine, and then use malamide chemistry to conjugate the peptide through a peg spacer, and then this peg is then attached to PLGA, and we make blend particles of PLGA peg peptide with polycaprolactone as the second uh, material. And the blend helps us to co-encapsulate two different drugs, lonidamine and paclitaxel, in the same particle. So first, in vitro data, you can see that when you give the drug alone, both even in the solution form or in the nanoparticle form, at one, this is micromolar, and, and this is micromolar, this should be micro, uh, M, um, it should be micro and not, not millimolar. Um, the, at one micromolar dose, we have about 50% of the cell surviving, because these are resistant cells. You know, and, and I want to focus your attention to this particular population. This is the one where we show the in vivo uh, data um, that in MDMB 231, five day of hypoxia. So 50% of the cells survive when you give the particle, the paclitaxel in nanoparticle or in solution. But when you give it with lonidamine, you get less than 10%. Especially with nanoparticle, uh, you get very, very low amounts of, of the uh, of cell surviving. Same dose but the fact that your delivery is much more efficient. And then in vivo, we developed this model, the same model that I described, 231 breast cancer in the athymic mice or nude mice. You have 20 milligram per kilogram of paclitaxel and 80 milligram per kilogram of lenidamine by tail vein. We then measure tumor volumes daily to see the effect of tumor suppression. And then at the time of sacrifice, usually in this case 28 days post single dose therapy, we collect the tumor and we weigh it and see that the mass of tumor that's remaining, in this case it was the smallest, and this is characteristic of the fact that this drug is most effective. So by shutting down the glucose metabolism, we're able to now produce less lactate, we're able to show that that less lactate production actually makes these cells change their properties from a resistant phenotype back into wild type, and the drug paclitaxel is much more effective. Yep. Yep. I just wonder how much percentage of the drug target to the tumor? Well, very good question. So in this case we are seeing about 15, 10 to 15 percent because it's EGFR um, targeted particles. 10 to 15 percent of our drug gets into the tumor after injection uh, with the nanoparticle. Only about you know, 1 percent gets with solution form. So we have, this data has been published now and we have tumor volumes, we have also done histology after the animals were sacrificed so you can see that you know, some of the uh, glucose markers and, and PGP and all the other markers we have done, we have looked at them and showed down regulation. So it's an interesting approach, how do you overcome resistance, not just by improving drug delivery efficiency but also to think about what happens in these cells, what makes them go rogue and how can we then break, bring back that signal so that they can succumb to chemotherapy at lower doses and help to improve the outcome in cancer patients. The second example I'm going to touch upon is this area of RNA interference. So you guys have probably heard about, this is a huge issue here in, in, uh, throughout the world, that how can we understand a little bit about uh, the uh, uh, some of these molecular therapies and what, what then are the challenges. So RNA interference is described here a little bit. Well, we have our DNA molecules in our cells that produces messenger RNA. This messenger RNA then goes into, after it leaves the nucleus, goes into the cytoplasm and binds to the uh, endoplasmic, uh, uh, with the ribosome, excuse me, and forms the protein. So all of our message it comes from the DNA, it's transcribed and then translated right at the ribosome and the message is then converted into a protein molecule. The protein then gets released, post uh, glycosylated or post-translationally modified and it can either remain in the cell and function in the cell or come out of the cell and function in the body. So if we have a disease where the protein is the culprit, one of the strategy is to shut down this message from being translated. And the process is called RNA interference. RNA interference basically means that this messenger RNA will somehow not be able to decode the message it's carrying. And so the idea here is very simple. If you take a messenger, uh, the uh, RNA, a small interfering RNA, um, with these are double-stranded, typically small blocks of, of nucleic acid with complementary strand to the messenger, messenger RNA, 
and give it to the cell and as long as it reaches to the right place inside the cell where the messenger RNA is, it will bind to this messenger, messenger RNA and it will prevent the messenger RNA from binding to the ribosome and there are enzymes in our cells called argonauts that actually cleave off this messenger RNA so the message doesn't get transcribed. It's a very potent method of silencing genes because you can need only nanomolar concentration of this sRNA to exert this function. The problem, as you can imagine, is how do you get these molecules to go into the cell after they've been given to a patient? So the challenge is drug delivery. And, and the process, again, is described here. You have a double-stranded sRNA. It has, binds to the risk complex. Once it binds to the risk complex, that risk complex together with the, uh, uh, the uh, antisense strand of the RNA binds to the messenger RNA and breaks the messenger RNA down and prevents the signal from being, or the gene from being, from coding to the right protein. And this has led to a Nobel Prize. Craig Mello and Andrew Fire got Nobel Prize on RNA interference. Work has progressed tremendously, starting from C. elegans to mammalian cells to actual human application. And there are many companies that have invested millions and millions of dollars in developing this technology to make therapies. Some companies are now faltering and they're coming out of the market like Roche, but because of the challenge of drug delivery. How do you get these molecules to the right place? So I, in 2010, uh, as uh, Dr. Ahmed mentioned, uh, we got a funding from NCI through the second round of this uh, Alliance for Nanotechnology. And we came up with this idea of developing nanostructures through combinatorial design application. So we asked the question, if you're going to use sRNA or any other type of payload, instead of going to the shelf each time and saying, what is the right delivery system for this particular payload, could we create a modular system that allows us to then mix and match depending on the payload and depending on our delivery need. Where does it need to go? Does it need to go to the liver? Does it need to go to the breast tissue, to the ovarian tissue, to the um, brain, etc.? And so Arun Iyer is a chemist in my lab, Shanti is a PhD student, and this work is done in collaboration with Jean Fenduan, who is a physician scientist at Mass General Hospital in Boston, to address specifically drug resistance using MDR uh, multidrug resistant genes and drug delivery uh, so silencing the, the genes that are upregulated in drug resistance and then how we can improve drug delivery. So data I'll present today will focus on just um, using these particular systems for gene silencing. What we are doing is we have the right payload, we take advantage of various types of polymers that then can be functionalized. So we create what we call Lego blocks of different kinds and then these Lego blocks are then fitted together to create these nanostructures, and depending on the payload need and the delivery need, we will select the right kind of Lego blocks. So you can take the red one and the green one and the orange one and mix and match them to meet the end need of what you're trying to deliver. And you can target these. You can also put imaging agents like MRI contrast agent or fluorescent contrast agent or radioactive contrast agents to try to enhance image-guided delivery. Uh, the, for example, I'll share with you is specifically using a polymer called hyaluronic acid. And so hyaluronic acid is interesting. It's a biodegradable polymer. It's part of our natural system. It's a polysaccharide, and it's considered uh, a safe material for application in, in drug delivery. They're actually human products already in the clinic. But we got interested in this particular polymer because of very important property in cancer. It is binding to the receptor called CD44, which is expressed on cancer stem cells. So today there is a whole theory about drug resistance and the, uh, uh, the formation or, or the presence of stem cells in tumors. Just yesterday there was an article in Nature and in Science about the role of cancer stem cells in terms of propagating cancer after the tumor is removed and what happens to, to make sure that, you know, the, the, uh, if you want to really kill the cancer mass completely, you have to go after these cancer stem cells. So the interesting thing is that this polymer binds to those cancer stem cells and if we can deliver efficiently to that specific cell, it's almost like, you know, taking out the most, uh, the harshest of the enemies from, from the population. And, and uh, our approach is based on making these Lego blocks. So we make Lego blocks with different lipid content and with different nitrogen content for sRNA delivery and we've optimized this now and I'll give you some of the results we've obtained to with different sort of 
chain lengths of carbon chain lengths as well as nitrogen content. We attach one with thiol group so that we can form intermolecular disulfide bonds and that creates the, um, uh, the structure of our assembled system and keeps it intact. We have polyethylene glycol modified blocks to increase circulation time and then we have a, a peptide or antibody or targeting ligand modified block to enhance delivery efficiency to the right place in the body. So the data I'll show you is going to be with uh, use of uh, amine and, and lipid modified and PEG modified uh, blocks uh, with both uh, in vitro as well as in vivo. So with the hyaluronic acid, a question was very simple. We started to ask, can it deliver sRNA? So first question was, can it encapsulate and keep sRNA stable within a particle? And what is the size of these particles that are formed? If they're too large or they aggregate or they are not deliver holding on to sRNA, then they're useless to us. So we went through a lot of screens to come up with based on the chain length of the lipids and based on the amine content to find the right balance. The next thing was, once you put it in cells, do they go inside the cell? Are they able to be taken up by the cell membrane? Do they get into the endosome? And then once it gets into the endosome, does it escape the endosome? Because if it just sticks in the endosome, you know, you're not going to get any silencing. It's just going to be trapped. And then what is the efficiency of gene silencing? How good is this compared to what we have in the, uh, in, in the market right now? And then from there, the hits that we found, we then took to in vivo. We developed the tumor models. We have both, uh, uh, and I'll show you some examples of, of tumor models. But this work is now going into lung cancer models. And we have resistant lung cancer models with uh, various types of drugs. And the, the whole architecture, you know, we made almost like 500 different types of polymers ranging from simple lipid modified systems to different amines, whether one amine or two amines or three amines or four amines, and then going into multi-amines like spermine derivatives into what we now have right now is a low molecular weight PI modified HA, hyaluronic acid, which is a molecular weight of 10,000 for the polyethylene amine. And this is the best system for both in terms of its ability to encapsulate sRNA, hold and create small structures, keep it stable, enhance endosomal escape. And so this is the system we are going to be using for in vivo application. And the interesting thing we found is that when you have this PEI modified HA, so the green here represents the HA, the hyaluronic acid, and the red here represents the PEI, and these are our, our nucleic acid constructs. The nucleic acid forms a core shell structure. You can see this in the EM the transmission electron micrograph that the core here is slightly darker than the shell. And we can put 100% sRNA is encapsulated. That sRNA is electrostatically encapsulated. So when you put polyacrylic acid, which is a counter ion, it rele gets released and this band corresponds to the released nucleic acid. So we're able to encapsulate sRNA, we are able to uh, keep it into the structure. The structure has a diameter of 50 nanometer and the charge is negative. <coughs> Although it's PI modified, it's a net negative charge because of the fact that this is a core shell. The surface is still hyaluronic acid and this surface is essential for us to target CD44 receptors. And to do that, we tested in two different kinds of lung cancer models. These are small, non-small cell lung cancer. A549 is a regular tumor, and A549 is a resistant tumor. So lung cancer becoming resistant to chemotherapy. And you see the silencing efficacy for the PI derivative, almost 70% silencing at 100 nanomolar dose. It's a very, very potent sRNA. So we're able to improve. This. And here in the resistant, we are seeing less silencing, about 50%. But then what we found is that if you increase the duration of exposure, you actually continue to silence more and more. So this system at 24 hours is about 70 and 50. But with this a particular system, if you increase to 48 hours or 96 hours, you keep on seeing greater and greater silence in efficacy. So once we had this data, we then went into animals. These are our nude mice that were injected both with the wild-type tumor and the resistant tumor. And the circle here represents where the tumors are growing. They're basically growing in the flank region of these animals. And to show that we can target these particles to these tumors, we basically encapsulated, instead of the sRNA, a near IR fluorophore. In this case, the fluorophore is called indocyanin green, or ICG. And this indocyanin green is a FDA-approved fluorophore. It gets encapsulated in this HAPI and HAPEG blend particle. So now we have taken two Lego pieces and mixed them together and made nanoparticles. 
And injected by tail vein, so at 10 minutes after injection, you see that the entire body fluoresces because the, the particles are all over. But after four hours, you start to see tumor accumulation in the case of the wild type animals, and then some liver accumulation, and then the dye that comes out of these particles gets excreted through the bladder and then uh, in, into the urine. So, and then at 10 hours post-administration, the tumor accumulation continues to be there, whereas other parts of the body starts to clear it. And this is because these particles are still going to go into the tumor, and they just stick to the tumor, and they just remain there. In the, uh, uh, the uh, animals that have the resistance, interestingly, they form less blood vessels. So they still have the CD44 expression, but they're not as, uh, their vascularity is not as dense as the ones in the wild type. So we are seeing le uh, later accumulation. You see that at 10 hours we are starting to see tumor accumulation, but at four hours there was nothing in the tumors. But as you continue and you go to 24 hours and subsequent, you see this phenomena remaining. So the degree of targeting with these particles is based on both the ability to interact with CD44, and we have to make sure that the model that you are working with expresses CD44. But the other part of it is also that the blood vessel has to be there. There has to be plumbing to take these particles to the right place. And then silencing in vivo. So here is the wild type animal, and this is the drug resistant. Again, this is 24 hours. Because we are not reaching at a very high density in 24 hours, we're not seeing as efficient silencing. But in, in the wild tap, we are getting you know, uptake only in about four hours. So in 24 hours post-administration, we are seeing very high degree of silencing. We also use very low doses of sRNA, 0.5 milligram per kilogram dose given three times. If you go to the literature and look at some of the other people who are doing these studies, they go up to five milligram per kilogram. They go 10 times more, and they're not seeing as, you know, as efficient silencing as we are. I see two questions. Yep. Um, if you're dealing with something like a hypervascular tumor, such as the resistant one, uh, what would you do to getting your therapy in there if there is no way of actually delivering it? Yeah, well, so the, the other approach is, uh, that we have been thinking right now is um, uh, that even in those hypovascular tumors, what you want to do is you want to increase the residence time. Of, so even if you get 10% or 5% delivery, um, but if you can increase the residence time of your payload there, longer than it, you know, just a uh, solution form of the drug, would, that would give you tremendous benefit. Because these molecules are very, very potent. They don't need to be there in very large concentration, but they need to stay around. They need to be there when the cells are dividing in our most vulnerable phase of cell division or when, you, you know, there's enough of them to go into the cell, into enough of the cell population to actually make a difference. Follow-up to that, and you mentioned cell division is that the cancer stem cells don't go into cell division very right. often. That's correct. So, so the idea here is that you really want to reach to those areas. So now our focus is, you know, what we are trying to do is, you know, not just getting them into sort of the area where the blood supply is, but how to get them deeper into the into the tumor mass itself. And so we are thinking about physical approaches that will enhance permeability or use of, there is also work that's done in Ruslati's lab to look at various peptides that tend to enhance tumor permeability. So we are looking at multiple ways to enhance the delivery efficiency all the way into the core of the tumor. Uh, that's going to be critical because if that doesn't happen, then yeah, we are just simply getting these things to the periphery. The other thing is that these systems by themselves are not enough. This will only work with small molecule drug. So you need cell kill as well as, you know, you need to have RNA interference to change the phenotype, but then you will still need to hit them with the drug. So we are using, uh, you know, that's why this whole idea of combinatorial was coming out of the argument that, you know, instead of going to the shelf for small molecule drug and for sRNA, could we actually create one system that will allow us to then tailor it to the right payload? And, and if our payload changes, we can go back to, you know, our system and say, okay, what's the right delivery for that payload now? And that's what we are doing. Um, and it, I, I'm convinced that we're not just going to get sRNA therapy by itself. It has to be in, with small molecule drug. Just like antibodies are also delivered with small molecule drugs, this is also going to be with small molecule drug. Uh, I had one question here and then, yeah. Oh, I was wondering, which kind of cell type have higher androgenesis? Oh, good question. So, you know, is there any way to, 
Unfortunately, there's no way to predict from cells you know, that they'll be angiogenic or not. Uh, we have, so this, you know, this is sort of a, a, a snapshot of what we have done. We have looked at a couple of different cells. We have looked at uh, MDMB231 I talked about before, uh, these lung cancer models. We have looked at Hep G2, which is a liver cancer. We have looked at B16 melanoma. And we have a panel of tumor, not cells, but tumors that we know are highly vascular. That, like Hep G2 is, I mean, is incredibly bleedy. You know, I mean, if you, if you know, when it's developed in the liver, and you open it, just gushes out blood. Um, whereas these uh, lung cancer, like the 549, are very hardy. They're very, very dense tumors, yes. and so they have, they do not have blood supply. So we know from that, you know, which tumors make blood vessels and which do not in the animal. But you can't just tell. Like some people have tried to do this with veg VEGF levels. How much VEGF level do they secrete, and that becomes correlation to the. But unfortunately, it's not a direct correlation. Um, that you can look at VEGF levels to see if these things will be angiogenic or not. Yeah. Uh, I mean, good, and then. Uh, yeah, so I think CD44 is a pretty common receptor on a lot of cells, especially in hemophilic cells. That, but yeah. you're using an IV approach where you're injecting in the blood itself. So I'm quite surprised that the, the new mice model doesn't display any retention. That, yeah, that, so, you know, this is a good, uh, that's a very good question. So, yeah, in addition to tumors, stem cells, and CD44 expression, there's also expression, as he mentioned, in other cells in the body, including macrophages. We've also seen hepatocytes overexpressed to some degree, or not overexpressed, but express CD44. So there is some uptake in the liver. We're not sure whether this is macrophage mediated or it just binds to hepatocytes. We actually just finished a study with a collaborator on um, another sRNA delivery to the liver, and we find that there is silencing in the liver that's happening as well. So yeah, there is some nonspecific uptake. But the interesting thing here we are seeing is that the tumor uptake is quite markedly, and here there's no targeting. So coming back to the question of retention, you know, if we wanted to go to an animal model where we wanted to enhance retention, we could also, you know, in our case, we go back to our, our, our blocks and say, okay, can we take an active targeting strategy like EGFR peptide? that is can be combined with this structure and now we have both CD44 and EGFR specific. So can dual targeting help us to get more to the right place but also retain there for the right place. Uh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Don't mind my follow up. It's sure. Just, if you're trying to target two receptors on the same nanoparticle, it would mean that the, the receptors on the cell have to be in close proximity to each other. Not necessarily. So, the, the, if you so what the, the difference here is that if you are targeting based on surface modification of the particle, then yes, you, are, you will be absolutely right. You, you know, because if you let's say this is your you know the the different particle modifications that you wanted to make, and here is one strategy and another, the the complementary pieces has to fit in. But what is different about this is that the CD44 binding piece is in the cell system itself. The hyaluronic acid itself is CD44 binder. So all you, I need to worry about is the EGFR binding that will be on the surface. So it's, it's very different. As long as you know, the, EGF, the CD44 binding remains and doesn't get disturbed by the surface presence of EGFR, then I still will have complementary binding. But it's not going to be the issue of you know, making sure that the density remains. There will be specific orientations in which you will have to match up with the epitope. Yeah, yeah, but again, it's, you know, because we are using a peg spacer, so that allows us to get flexibility in the binding. It's not, it's tethered to the surface. So it's not a rigid structure that just, you know, plops out. And if it doesn't bind, it's not like, a, a, the, you know, if you take the analogy of when the NASA or, or when the spaceship docks on the space, on the, on the uh, there's the tube that goes up. That's a rigid structure. And so that has to fit nicely and, and has to be complementary fit. But in this case, it's a tethered structure. So it's, you know, what happens is that as long as you can take the tether and, and fit it, the rest of the structure can bend itself. Uh, Why, um, so if the blood oxygen accumulates in the liver, what does it make it difficult to find liver cancer? Very good question. So um, the good news there is that we are hoping, and again, this is one of those things that you know you want to try to solve one problem at a time. Uh, but we're hoping that at least people who have lung cancer will not have liver cancer because this would be a huge problem. Otherwise, you know, how you're trying to solve. Um, but the, the the question is relevant still because many times you get 
individuals who have their primary tumor in one location, but they'll have liver metastases. Yeah. So how do you, you know, overcome that? And so here, the, you know, one possibility is that, yeah, you could, if they have liver metastases, there will be some effect on the metastases as well. And that's why we have chosen in all of our studies to inject IV. There are other people who do intertumoral administration, you know, in their studies because they want to just give it to the tumor itself and they don't want this broader distribution. But that's not, you know, that's not clinically translatable. How many cancers can we, you know, inject intertumorally? If you can inject intertumorally, you can, dis you know, resect that cancer off. And so why, why would you even bother treating somebody with chemo if it's surgically resectable? Um, so, it, it, you know, I, I mean, the question is still relevant, you know, that you know, it's, uh, if, the liver, if there is liver metastasis, we would be able to see some effect on there. And is it, um, as far as early diagnostics go, would it be harder then to detect early liver cancer, like here the fluorescence, you know, if it was early because it's being noised out by the rest of the absorption. Yeah, so I would, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not proposing to use this strategy uh, of, you know, NIR dye as an early diagnostic okay, system. Awesome. No, no, I think for us it's okay. just to show evidence of targeting of our payload. Okay. You know, does it really get there and how long does it take and what is the difference between the two? Uh, and we knew, you know, just from looking at when you resect these tumors and you resect these tumors, we knew there were vascularity differences. But we also did a lot of um, cyt uh, flow cytometry studies to show that CD44 expression was same. So we were, we were very interested in this, asking this question, what is the, you know, uh, sort of, what, what's the balance between vascularity and receptor expression? Do you need one more than other, or can you, you know, if you have less vascularity and more expression, would the targeting be still be efficient? And we, the answer comes in here, because yeah, there is still targeting, but it's later than what we see here. So as long as we can keep the particles in the blood, we will be able to see. And I just had one more question, which sure. was if you do both systemic and tumor site injections, would that be more effective? Because I know you can remove the tumor, but you have those outlying cells. Right. Absolutely. And so that would be very effective. And actually, there are therapies. By the way, I don't want to discount those people who do in, you know, tumor administration. There is actually a brain tumor therapy called Gliadel, which is used now in clinic, and it is an approved product here and across the globe, where the surgeons would first go in, remove the tumor, and then the cavity that is remaining, they will fill it with these biodegradable wafers, and they will make sure that these wafers are delivering drugs over a long period of time. It's a wonderful therapy. It has actually improved the, the quality of lives of patients because they not have to go through systemic therapy, but also it's made the more, you know, the survival, uh, increase the survival time because brain tumor, as you know, is one of the most malignant and one of the most lethal tumors today, the six-month survival typically in brain tumor, and this has increased it to six years. So I'm just wondering how, how, how the mechanism of the SIRNA release from your materials even uh, after endos Endocytosis. Yeah, we can talk about that. I know Dr. Hamad is getting a little bit nervous because I'm running a little bit. Short. Let's talk about that afterwards. I, I mean, I'm happy to fill you in and you know how this thing is working because we have done all those studies. But I have one last example to share with you guys. And that is just, you know, the third, remember that I had three different challenges in drug delivery. One was the small hydrophobic molecule. The second one was the idea of how do you, you know, take these labile payloads and target them to the right place in the body. And the third one, can you take a drug that is injectable and try to convert it into an oral or a non-invasive you know, administered formulation? And so here is our third example where we are taking a very simple design of a nanosystem. It's an oil and water droplets. These are tiny oil droplets in the range of about 100 nanometer. And we basically make these, first we're making it with ultrasound, now we make it using a microfluidic system. Uh, we can generate liter quantity. This work is taken to a company that's uh, basically uh, now working with Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia to bring this to the clinic. And the idea is that if you take oils that are rich in these unsaturated fatty acids, especially the omega-3s, and make emulsion systems out of this, what we find is that we are able to change the biological properties. We are able to change the biodistribution profile. And particularly if you take one that has this deoxycholic acid, which is uh, basically a bile salt, we can make these droplets be absorbed orally and you get a much better bioavailability of drugs that have poor oral bioavailability. 
And so we took advantage of another interesting molecule. Being an Indian, you know, you almost, uh, or Asian, you almost uh, want, you know, want to work with some of the most common ingredients. And, and curcumin is a very common uh, material in, in, in Asian diet. Um, but it has a very interesting property. It is used as antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer. We wanted to test this particular activity of curcumin, which is it inhibits or it downregulates these efflux transporters. I mentioned about P glycoprotein, but there are other efflux transporters that are also downregulated by, and it's unlike some of the other molecules that have been used to, to bind with efflux transporters, this particular molecule actually inhibits the nucleic acid. So the, the, the message for making P glycoprotein is decreased. And, but the problem, again, like many other drugs, it has poor solubility and absolutely is not orally available. So, you know, one study that was done here in the U.S., they gave individuals something like 10 grams of curcumin and they couldn't get any of it detected in blood. So it's very, very poorly bioavailable. And so the idea was if you want to use this to inhibit efflux transporter or to inhibit enzyme or to improve its role in cancer, could we make it orally bioavailable? And then from there, how would it influence a drug also that is poorly available? So we used curcumin and we basically gave it to mice orally. We gave it in f um, uh, three different, uh, four different mice uh, and we gave it a dose three times. In this case, uh, 80 milligram per kilogram, which was found from the literature. And we measured what would happen to, the enz uh, to these efflux transporter and enzymes that are expressed in the intestine of these animals. So we harvested the tissue and then measured the levels. And what you see from these dark bands, this is our control. These dark bands correspond to the higher expression means darker bands, lower expression means lesser. When you give curcumin in solution, you see some down regulation. When you give it in our nano emulsion, you see that in some cases you completely eliminate the transporter from the intestine. And same thing with this enzyme. You inhibit the enzyme activity. It's not common. You still need to optimize the system so that all four animals would see down regulation. But we do see some effects of curcumin. But interestingly, when you down regulate these efflux transporters in the GI tract and then give a drug, again, paclitaxel, which doesn't get absorbed orally, so that's why it's an injectable product, we now see a greater absorption. This is the plasma profile in animals that have tumor. This is, have tumor that, this is an ovarian cancer. And we collected plasma over a continuous time, up to 24 hours, and measured the levels of paclitaxel upon oral administration. So we gave this product orally and measured how much blood levels we are going to see. And we also shown that there's greater tumor accumulation because we are giving it in animal. This is six hours after administration, so somewhere around here, when you give, we max out on the plasma, we measure the tumor levels as well. And you see the higher level of tumor accumulation. And this translates into more effective anti-cancer therapy. So the idea is that instead of having patients go to clinic for cancer therapy, could we actually make this more manageable at home, converting a drug that was previously injectable into an oral formulation. And so we are very much interested in, in looking at drug delivery from that perspective, because there are many, many examples of drugs that are currently administered in the clinic. And how can you take advantage of drug delivery like this to try to overcome some of the barriers? So with that, those are the three examples we talked about in drug delivery and then one on the diagnostic side. Let me just summarize a few things about you know, what we are doing. First of all, you know, the problem of cancer is huge. I know many of you have data. There's about you know, almost 600,000 patients die uh, in the United States uh, and the numbers just keep on increasing. Uh, 1.6 million cases of cancer in the United States and then 6 million deaths, uh, 600,000 deaths in the United States per year. And these numbers are huge. I mean, they're, they're in all over the world, and we are seeing some increasing trends, especially in, in Asian countries, in India, China, and Middle East, and other places in the world. So we need to find better diagnostic systems, better imaging systems, better therapeutic systems. And I have a strong believer that there is a role of nanotechnology in all of this. I know you heard about some of the diagnostic systems that people are developing. You'll have, hear about this in other talks as well. Um, what I told you about is the uh, idea of using this part particle-based diagnostics that we have developed, which is the gold-coated microspheres. And I also talked a little bit about some of the drug delivery examples. We had three on the board here, um, the EGFR-targeted biodegradable polymer for drug resistance. 
the idea of uh, targeting sRNA to cancer and making sure that we can deliver using these hyaluronic acid assemblies, and then use of this emulsion system <coughs> with omega-3 fatty acids and curcumin pretreatment to improve oral bioavailability of uh, poorly available drugs. And in all of these, there's a common thread that runs through. One of the ones is that we are very much focused on two aspects of nanotechnology safe materials because I'm convinced that in medicine especially, if you don't work with safe materials, if you're going to work with materials that are controversial, you are going to, you know, pretty much it will be a, a dead end even before you get started. Because right now there is so much risk averseness in terms of drug development in the United States and all over the world. And trying to get these products into the clinic is going to be impossible if there's even a concern about safety. So safe materials, thinking about biodegradable polymers, thinking about materials that have already have history of human use, and then edible oils that you know, pretty much are in our diet and how we can take advantage of technologies, sophisticated technologies, but still work with systems that are adaptable to clinical translation. And then the other part is that we tend not to, especially in academia, not to focus too much on scalability. This is not going to happen in a test tube. You know, this has to happen in large scale manufacturing operation that can basically move to GMP type of facilities. So if you are going to have a fabrication approach that is based on making systems uh, only at, at the test tube level, you know for sure that it's not going to move forward because it's really, you know, this is one of the barriers to translation. So those two are common threads in all of the safe materials and scalable fabrication methods. We talk about biodegradable polymers, this work now you know, is moved into a um, uh, uh, preclinical realm, assembly using hyaluronic acid and emulsions we already make using microfluidic systems. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, we have some time for questions also. I'm happy to, to, to answer any additional questions.